The Nigerian Economic Summit Group's Policy Innovation Center is the first public policy institution in Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa tasked with applying behavioral theory and other innovative policy tools to inform uh, policy design and implementation uh, in Africa. The center seeks to improve the design and implementation of government policies and programs in Nigeria through lessons from behavioral and social science as well as other policy tools. Joining us to discuss further is uh, Dr. Osashi uh, Dirisu, Deputy Director at the Policy Innovation Center. Good morning, Doctor. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. So can you talk to us about the discipline of good behavioral... Good morning. Welcome. The behavioral insights, behavioral <laughs> economics. Can you talk to us about that? That particular discipline. Thank you so much for having me. So behavioral insights is really around using the lessons we learn from behavioral and social sciences to understand how people behave in practice. Why is it important to understand how people behave in practice? Standard theories and standard approaches to policy making assume that people behave in rational ways. But contrary to that, people actually do not make always make rational decisions that would maximize their benefit or maximize their utility. And so we have to understand, first of all, what those biases are in the decision making process. And when we do this, we can define their problems better and based on accurate problem definitions, design more effective solutions to support behavior change. All right. So therefore, that those insights can hopefully shape uh, public policy. How can they shape public Absol policy? So absolutely. When we are able to, first of all, clearly define problems, then we can go out and test possible interventions. So we're not making guesses. Or we're not making assumptions. We're testing in interventions that would work and then we'll come up with innovative using innovative approaches we'll come up with evidence-driven solutions that can now shape and um, public policy and just to mention here also that behavior is context dependent so for example what works in the west may not necessarily work in nigeria so one of the things that behavioral insights helps us to do is to contextualize behavior and all the contextual issues that can impact on success so that we put all that in consideration when we are making recommendations for policy so policy with behavioral insights is now evidence-based as opposed to making guesses or assumptions that may actually not translate to reality. All right, great stuff. So Nigeria, for instance, estimated 200 million population, six geopolitical zones, vastly multicultural. How do you come up with a reliable sample size to conduct a you know, behavioral analysis that shapes public policy? Okay, and um, first of all, when anytime we're thinking about going to get um, data, get information, do um, testing, the first thing we think about is what are all the diverse demographic stratifiers we want to consider? So in, a, in an ethnically diverse country like Nigeria, we'll be thinking around religion, ethnicity, age. I mean, for example, someone who lives in an urban area, outcomes for that person will be different for someone who lives in a rural area. So these are all the different stratifiers, male, female, gender. So these are all the different stratifiers we first consider. And then we use a uh, population-based um, um, calculations to estimate what the sample size would be. But not just the sample size, we also take into consideration all the diversities that need to be considered based on what I've said earlier about ensuring that policy um, recommendations are um, take into consideration what the context um, is, the environment. Okay. Now, so speaking, you mentioned data. So speaking of the estimated population, we don't really know how many people we are, although the government has made provisions for, you know, census later this year. Um, just last week, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, uh, Chief Timmy Presilva, was lamenting the lack of reliable data on fuel consumption. What's the observation around Nigeria's data challenges? Is it that data collection is too hard or is too expensive or how, do you, how would you frame that challenge? So it's a combination of factors. I think one of the most important things, uh, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we have with data is we are not collecting administrative data at source. So if I'm thinking around understanding consumption, for example, I have two options. I can look at the supply side 
So there are estimates of what the supply is like. So I need to, I, I can look at that or I can look at consumption. I can track consumption, but it's important to consistently collect comprehensive, reliable data across different areas within our country to ensure that we have data that we can simply just analyze where we need them. So for example, for things like basic immunization, healthcare coverage, even something as simple as cervical cancer screening. If I want to know, for example, how many women have been screened in 2021, I don't need to commission a survey to do that. All I need to do is track or collect all the data, administrative data that has already been collected across the country on cervical cancer screening, and then do my analysis and then I have my findings. But because we are not routinely, consistently collecting administrative data around the country, it now creates that burden to always go into the field to collect primary data. Data collection is very expensive. Think about Nigeria, think about the complexities with infrastructure, with roads. Now we have security problems. You can't always send people to hard to reach areas. Sometimes some places are not accessible by road. People have to go by boat or, you know. you know. So people actually go through precarious situations to collect data in Nigeria. Yes, data collection is expensive. Yes, data collection is hard. And yes, it's very challenging to collect ethical data. So if we invest more in having administrative routine data captured at source, then it will be much easier um, for us to have data to work with. Thank you so much. Uh, there's some more data I want to have you to look at. You're a development and gender expert. Um, there's uh, a chart here I want to show you on STEM graduates from 2019, split between male and female. Um, as far as, you know, I guess, you know, behavioral studies and so on and so forth, what, what's, what's to be observed, I guess, or said for the reason behind the low level of female graduates in, you know, engineering and computing disciplines? Okay, we, we have to start from the basics. So first of all, how is a girl socialized? I always love to start by asking that question. So how is a girl socialized? You know, she comes into the family and we have the stereotypes around STEM careers, you know, staring the girl in the face. So she's more, the, the family inclines her more to um, domestic roles, you know, things that have, to, you know, soft skills. And so that's the starting point, you know. We need to socialize girls, break those stereotypes, you know, remove those barriers that limit girls from seeing themselves as possible engineers or computer scientists in future. So that's where it starts from. The second point I would like to make is that STEM degrees are long, okay? Even when you eventually think about getting a girl into university, the thinking is get do a four year course, do you know short course, quickly come out and get a job and get married, because you also want to reduce the pressure of having family ask a girl, oh, you, you, you're already getting to 22, 21, you need to get married. And then she's, she has two, three years to go um, within a, a STEM um, career. STEM careers are, are currently male dominated. If we want to encourage girls to go into STEM careers, then we need to begin to mentor them, not from university, but from primary school. So we need to begin to create that possibility open up their minds to the thinking and possibility that they can actually get into a STEM career and thrive. And it's important also to know that for us to do that, we have to think about all the barriers so around um, funding, also barriers around the fact that, you know, if you're going into a STEM um, career as a woman, you're going to have to face there have to be enabling policies, enabling environment that ensure that she can compete favorably with men. Because yes, this lady is competent, but just on the basis of some gender stereotypes, she may be limited from getting um, the role that she, she needs to get. So we need to think about that. We need to also involve women in policy making, in decision making, women who are ready in STEM, that girls can see as role models and then involve them in the policy process so that they can think about adaptive ways of, of ensuring that we, we put girls, you know, at the forefront of driving this change, this, this gender gap that we currently see in, in STEM. All right. Well, so it looks like the Policy Innovation Center has got a lot of, you know, moving targets. Well, what's, what's the progress that, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what's the, what's the progress yes. that, you know, that you've made since, I guess, your launch um, in October? I think it was October of last year. Yes. Yes, so we launched um, October 25, um, 2021, um, so just about three and a half months old. 
but we, we, we're making quite a lot of progress. We, we had conversations across different sectors. Um, we're currently working on a grant to improve accountability and transparency in Nigeria, and that is funded by MacArthur Foundation. We've started to do some work around looking at um, the issues that put risk drivers for young people and uh, children getting out of school early. So we're looking at, you know, what the negative what the challenges are with at-risk children and out-of-school children. We're actually starting an assessment, looking at that across the country on the 1st of March. We're also having conversations, like I said, across um, different sectors. Hopefully, we're hoping also that we can support um, some conversations around electoral participation. So early days, we're very busy, but maximizing the opportunity that we have um, to make a difference with um, improving behavioral informed policy decision making in Nigeria. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Oshashi uh, Dirisu, uh, Deputy Director, Policy Innovation Center, appreciate your time today.